Okay, this guy's reading about minus 80. Fairly close station. And the beam is pointed right at that station. I know it's just across town about five miles. So let's see if we can null this one out. Okay, there's 20 dB. There's 30. There's 40. An honest 40 of attenuation on that station. So here's a really far out station in Quincy, Mass, south of Boston. Completely takes them out. Okay, I know what some of you are saying now. Mike's gone completely crazy. He's got beads all over this thing. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. On this line coming off our antenna. What are we trying to do? We are trying to completely isolate the feed line from the loop antenna. And with our unbalanced feed, that's going to take a little bit of decoupling. Now when you're uh, selecting your core material for your snap-on ferrites, it's best to use uh, cores that are going to be effective in the frequency range that you're using the loop in. In our case, we're, we're designing a shortwave loop, so we would like to have a fairly high permeability core like this 31 material from Ferrite. Um, the 43 type snap-on beads are going to work okay, but you may need to use more of them than the 31 type material. So, I have now tried three of the four configurations shown in the diagram. We did the, uh, the simple wraparound with the hot to the shield. We did the uh, basically the split at the very top and then grounding everything back at the feed. And uh, we shorted the top part so that the right hand part of the antenna appears to be a solid bar. All three of them gave similar performance. And it seems like the choking beads that I put on the bottom kind of force all the loops to be fairly well balanced. Um, I'm only getting 20 to 30 dB of rejection on the nulls but I will admit it's very crude since I don't have a receiver out there, so I cannot sharply measure the null. I would have to drag everything out into the field and, and do some critical measurements. Maybe I will get there when I go to the next step. And the next step is, of course, a purely balanced loop. So with a purely balanced loop, we will have to have some kind of balanced feed at the bottom. So that's the next step. Okay, here's the fun part you guys have been dreading. A little bit of theory. Uh, let's try to talk about loop antennas and avoid math as much as possible. And models, and modeling. Specifically, we want to understand small loops. By small, I mean loops with a circumference of less than 0.1 wavelengths. The aim of any receiving antenna is to convert an electromagnetic wave into a voltage, the voltage we send to the receiver. Faraday's law of induction, which is sometimes called the law of electromagnetic induction, states that the induced electromotive force in a loop is directly proportional to the time rate of change of the magnetic flux through the loop. This is the whole principle of generators, motors, and antennas. However, some bad effects from the electrostatic component of the incoming wave may also uh, come in due to imbalance. This kind of vertical antenna that we've arrived at, looking at this diagram, can spoil the whole thing and you end up with uh, bad nulls, screwed up patterns, and so on. That's the antenna effect. Unwanted capacitive disturbances can be reduced by placing an electrostatic shield around the loop antenna. A metal tube can be used, 
A gap between the outer tube and the inner conductor is needed to prevent the metal tube or shield from acting like a shorted turn. So we have to put a gap in there um, so we break up the, uh, the turn so it doesn't short out uh, both the electric and magnetic fields. Typically for symmetry this is located at the opposite end of the feed at the very top of the loop. Oh, and adding that screen. The screen does not eliminate the electric field. If it did, magnetic coupling into the loop would also stop. What's actually happening is twofold. It's reducing the effects of nearby capacitive discontinuities that could influence the pattern or detune the loop in the case of a resonated loop. It also helps to balance the loop by providing a continuous capacitance all around the loop. But make no mistake, even though we call it a shield or a magnetic loop, it's part of the antenna just as much as the loop is. The metal outer tube is grounded and the electrical connection is made to the magnetic loop either at its highest impedance point or over some fractional segment of its circumference. As we have seen in the diagram, there's some pretty clever loop feed mechanisms, but the balance connection is really the preferred one and it offers the best pattern fidelity. The unbalanced connection is also feasible with some slight performance penalties. Instead of a thick outer shield with a significant coaxial spacing to the inner loop, coax line will, su will suffice in many cases. The coax approach will have less Q than a proper oversized outer shield, but in an untuned receive-only version like we're using, this is of little practical consequence. The shield also serves to maintain loop balance with respect to ground by forcing the capacitance between all portions of the loop to essentially be identical. One nice aspect of loop antennas is their self-balancing characteristic. They naturally want to be balanced. By balanced, I mean if we we're talking about a dipole antenna, you'd want perfect balance and ideally you get it when the two ends are the same diameter, same length to the feed point. With perfect balance, no interaction with the feed line occurs on either transmit or receive, so no distortion in the pattern occurs. This is hard to accomplish in practice in the real world where the feed line itself is unbalanced, it has currents on it, you've got the variable environment, you've got variable height on each side of the dipole, the ground under each leg might be different, or if you don't measure accurately, like me, I'm guilty of making some pretty funny looking dipoles. The folded dipole is a huge step up in this regard. It naturally balances itself even with a so-so balan or twin lead feed line. And beyond being a bit more broadbanded, it will almost always have a better pattern than an ordinary dipole will. That is, in the real world. The loop is a lot like this. It wants to be balanced. In fact, if we take our big unbalanced hot to the shield in our loop, our first, first principles loop, and decouple the coax at the feed with balans, like a one-to-one -one balan, or better, a number of spaced current chokes, we can trick the loop into a pretty good balance. Let's review the two things that guarantee good loop performance. And by good loop performance, I mean the classic definition of a perfect donut pattern with deep nulls, and the ability to null out offending stations, and with some capacitive effects isolation. Hopefully we get a little bit of noise rejection as well. The first idea is to make the loop small. Small loops, regardless of their shape, have a far field pattern very similar to that of a small magnetic dipole, normal to the plane of the loop. A magnetic dipole? What's a magnetic dipole? Are you just making this stuff up, Mike, at this point? The small loop is essentially a magnetic dipole because of its uniform current around the loop. So the field polarization is orthogonal to that of a real dipole. Remember, the donut pattern is off the ends as opposed to broadside with a real dipole. There's a mathematical formula based on the Fourier series that keeping the circumference to a wavelength of less than 0.1 will make the second contributing term go to a low enough value that it can be ignored. As the loop ratio grows, however, two things happen. The gain of the major lobes in the donut become reduced and the nulls begin to get filled in with that energy. This is what's happening with our large loop as we go up in frequency. Eventually the gain shifts mostly to the broad side like a normal delta or quad loop. But a small untuned loop or probe is not very efficient and has very low resistance. That's why they're used predominantly as receiving antennas, where losses are not so important. 
Even so, we may need an amplifier with our small loop. The second way to preserve performance and retain the noise cancellation benefits uh, with a larger loop, and not to have the antenna effect spoil everything, is to aim for perfect balance all around the loop. That means an accurate split location, similar diameter conductors all around, a thick outer sheath to isolate the inner and outer coupling effect due to the skin effect, uniform capacitance from electrostatic shield to loop all around the circumference, and finally to force a pure balance feed. Our oversized loop is large enough not to require an amplifier. Adding the shield has the effect of somewhat reducing the overall pickup of the loop, but this loss is generally offset by the increase in the null depth of the loop. Proper balance of the loop of a loop amplifier requires that the load on the loop also be balanced. This must be respected if you use a ballon or an amplifier. So in summary, bigger, small untuned loops are more efficient at any given frequency. Keep the loop small if you want excellent null performance. We're talking between 40 and 60 dB if you do it right, and a clean pattern all around. Maintain perfect symmetry mechanically and electrical all around the loop. If it looks non-symmetrical, even on the schematic, if it looks non-symmetrical, it's impossible for it to be perfectly balanced at all frequencies. Utilize size, thick conductors, balance, and shielding to reduce the antenna effect. Three major factors spoil the pattern. Balance, the antenna effect, and loop size. And finally, decouple your feed line. So I've taken the loop completely off. I did not want to just eyeball where we wanted to put the gap in the coax. I wanted to make sure I had the exact center to put the gap. Okay, so I've split the coax right at the top of the loop. So next we are going into our fully balanced loop configuration. With the fully balanced loop, we have the split at the top, and we're going to feed each of the legs on the bottom with a balanced signal. Now we can do that with a balanced feed line directly, like a twin lead or some type of open wire feeder, or we can attempt to design a ballon, and uh, the ballon uh, can maintain the balance on the antenna side, but convert the secondary side to single-ended to drive the coax. Now we know that the impedance of the loop antenna is very, very low. And uh, if we would like to recover signal over a wide bandwidth, we might benefit from a step-up transformer. So this is kind of a backwards ballon. You usually think of a ballon like a 9 to 1 or something, where you have the 50 ohm side, and then you have the 9 to 1 step up and you're feeding some kind of long wire or something. Well this is just the opposite. We want the balance side to be the low impedance side and we want the 50 ohm side to be the unbalanced side. Uh, so instead of an un, -un this is this is a ballon but it's a low to high step up ballon. Um, one to one is a good place to start and you can use a conventional current ballon or a conventional voltage ballon at one to one, and that, that probably would work for what we're trying to do. But I'd like to do a little bit of impedance matching too to see if we can't get some more signal out of the loop. So I'm going to attempt something like a nine to one step up. So on the loop side, we're going to be nine times lower than 50 ohms. So it's going to be down around, you know, below 10 ohms kind of thing on that end, and we're going to step up to, to 50 ohms. So thinking that the loop is between 1 and 10 ohms, we're going to step that up to 50 ohms over as wide a bandwidth as possible. Now the easiest type of ballon to build is a voltage ballon when you're doing these ratios. It's just easier to do. So if I put, say, four turns on the loop side, if I want to step up uh, 
and make a 9 to 1 or a 10 to 1 or whatever, I'm going to have to have, you know, a lot of turns on the secondary to feed the 50 ohms. Now, the other thing people are saying, don't you really need to ground the loop? You can't have the loop floating on that primary. Uh, there could be a static problem, and you're absolutely right. But as soon as we put a center tap in that primary and ground it, that's going to unbalance the loop because we don't know that we've got perfect balance at that point. However, we could use a static discharge resistor there, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to use something like a 10K resistor to ground, which is enough to, quote-unquote, ground the loop for static, but it should not disturb the balance of the loop. So there will be a center tap. It's just going to be a center tap for a 10K ohm resistor. Then on the secondary side feeding the coax, one side will be grounded and the other will feed the, the coax going back to the shack. Now you're saying, well, hold it, a voltage panel, and that doesn't do very much uh, for isolating the coax. What about the currents on the line and all of those beads we had? Well, guess what? You're still going to need those. You're not going to need as many, but you still are going to need beads on the line because you still need current isolation on the line. So it's getting pretty complicated, isn't it? We need a voltage balance and current balance in order to keep this thing balanced and to keep the antenna effect away and the common mode currents from disturbing the pattern. Hey, look at this voltage balance that we've built. We've got the 10K resistor on the center tap and the center tap does not need to be super accurate because it's not going to disturb the balance because it's such a high impedance compared to the, the loop itself. But it is effectively going to discharge the static on that floating loop inside the coax. And then we have the 12 turn secondary, 4 turns on the primary, 12 turns on the secondary, so we have four turns on that primary, that low Z side, and we have 12 turns on the secondary. So that's a 3 to 1 voltage ratio. We square that, and that equals 9 to 1 impedance step up. So that's going to take our 4, 5, 6 ohms of loop impedance and transform it up closer to 50 to 75 ohms, which is what we're looking for. I've also shown the, uh, the choke bead because I think we will still need to have uh, some choking or some, some current choking on the feed line itself. You might put three or four beads below, just below the feed point. So uh, if it turns out that this is a disaster and does not work, we will go back to the tried and true one-to-one -one current balance, which is a bifiler wind on a on a similar core. This is a way oversized core. We could put two or three watts through this core, but uh, we're just using it for receiving and uh, much easier to see using an oversized type 43 core. Um, this probably if you were going more toward low frequency VLF, you could use some other core materials that would have higher permeability and would work a lot better at VLF and LF. But for shortwave, the 43 style core works okay for transformer. So this is the final hookup. The transformer, voltage transformer, low to high with a few beads. And we're going to see how a hopefully perfectly balanced loop is going to work. So I thought four to one would, uh, would be a little bit better situation. So I've reduced the turns on the secondary, and now uh, this this is a two to one, and now this should provide a four to one impedance. Just wanted to show you what that looks like before I saw it. I had to take the radio out like the radio to the, out to the work. I couldn't do the nulling from inside, so the radio's out here listening to 160 meters. So we'll use the radio out here and be able to get more accurate readings on the nulls. That's the only purpose of this. 
I've got some some AM check targets figured out. A little bit bright sun here today, but I think we'll be able to see the meter. And I'll take some data and we'll see what the loop is doing. As we look up, you can see I've restricted it to five beads on the coax and uh, I'm using LMR240 now. It's about a 15 foot chunk of wire. I'm trying to do everything right out here to get good measurements. Let's look at the receiver a little closer. Okay, I've got a bead on the power coming in. I've got a ground rod driven and the chassis grounded. Hope you can see that. Coming right into the rear of the receiver. So I'm trying to do it somewhat right. Now the one thing we can't control is that metal rod that's going up the middle of the loop, but it's essentially in the middle and it shouldn't cause any trouble. So I've got a little bit of cloud cover so you can see the receiver. Um, I'm in the AM mode at the 4 kilohertz bandwidth, medium AGC. But regardless of uh, the AGC settings, the RSSI, or the Receive Signal Strength meter on this receiver, does not change. It gives you an accurate uh, dBm number on that meter. So uh, we can look at uh, a number of stations that uh, I know are within 75 miles. Uh, the furthest south is probably just south of Boston and Quincy, and uh, Worcester, Mass is out there a little bit, but um, these are all within 75 miles radius. We'll use these as our check targets, and we can look for the nulls and so on. So we'll start at the bottom of the band at 590, and we'll go as high as 1590 uh, kilohertz. Okay, so this is uh, this is somewhere down in Boston. I'm going to attempt to null it out. Okay, we got about minus 65 showing on this station. And I'm going to rotate the loop to try to null it out. Uh, let's go the other way, I can't turn it. There we go. Okay, we're up at 8.30 now, working our way down. Okay, we're at 8.50. Wow. I'm at least getting 35. It's taking the station right out. There's another fairly close station hovering around minus 80 at the maxima. getting over 40. This guy's only about four miles away, four or five miles away. So we're getting at least 40. So here's another fairly close station in Manchester, 1370. But I'm not getting much more than 25 on this. So here's a really far out station in Quincy, Mass, south of Boston. completely takes them out. So here's a station that's east of me. Pretty much taking it out. So. Here's CHU. Pretty much take it out. It's not a very strong signal. Here's CHU 7850. Let's try to null that out.
Yeah. Pretty good, no? 7850. Back to the maximum. Okay. Pretty good balance. There's 15. 15 megahertz. WWV. Let's try to null that guy out. Definitely got a null there. Okay, let's try 10. Okay. Right there, it's a no. That's right at WWV, due west. So it is doing the job. Okay, this is uh, DDH, attempting to null it out. Definitely getting some nulling on the station. Now we'll go to the maxima. And nulling it out. So it is still giving some nulling uh, effect as high as 11 megahertz. I just don't think it's as good as it should be and uh, I think a smaller diameter loop would be in order. But uh, it just shows that the, uh, the loop is very effective and it's pointing right at Germany where it should be <laughs> and the nulling is occurring right where you would expect it getting rain down here we had a little shower a few minutes ago so a little bit of rain coming down from the tree as I turn the loop This is W1AW down in Connecticut. I've got the loop oriented south. And it's about four in the afternoon. Now I'm going to go to the dipole, which is also oriented to cover the south. Similar strength, maybe a little bit stronger than the loop, but of course we're also picking up some noise from something. So the loop is nulling out the noise source, which uh, is likely the house, since the house is uh, east of the loop, and uh, W1AW is south, so we're getting some nulling of whatever noise the house is generating. And W1AW is coming through cleanly. Uh, so I went up band to 80 meters to hear W1AW, and it's coming up quite nicely on the loop, but of course we have a tuned dipole on 80 meters, so the dipole of course is blasting. Okay, we've chased W1AW up to its 40 meter frequency. Loop still do doing a good job, but of course again this is a tuned dipole for 40 meters. It's an 80-40 trap. Okay, here's the loop on 20 meters. Short skip coming in on the loop. And now the dipole. W1AW on 17 meters coming in on the loop. 
and now on the dipole. Oh, maybe we did get it. Hold on. Here's the loop. 15 meters. I think we found W1AW even on 15 meters. What a signal. And on the dipole. So did you think I was going to uh, hear W1AW on 10 meters? Believe it or not, it's there. Let's bring our bandwidth down. Let's see if the dipole can hear it. Yep, the dipole's hearing it. And we'll go back to the loop. Okay, a pretty impressive display. We've been able to pick up W1AW's 4 or 5 o'clock broadcast on all the amateur frequencies that they broadcast on. Okay, I know what some of you are saying. Mike, you're driving me loopy with all those loops. And... Uh, so we've given a fair treatment to the coaxial untuned loop and uh, I think this will give you guys some ideas on uh, building your own. We did some local check targets in the AM broadcast band. We tried a shortwave station. Uh, we saw how it improved reception certainly on 160 meters pretty dramatically. And it picked up signals throughout the whole shortwave band with no preamplifier needed driving 150 feet of coax, so that tells you that the loop does have some sensitivity to it. Now, if I had to do it again, I would cut the size of the loop in half. I think it's way oversized. That's definitely hurting the nulling ability above about 2 megahertz. And if you cut the loop in half, I think you'd get better performance at higher frequencies. If you're going to put this thing on a rotator especially, you want to make sure that you've got good nulls and that's going to help you to uh, fight QRM and noise sources. So I hope you've enjoyed this second video uh, on, the, uh, on the loop antenna. Next we're going to try an amazing thing. We are going to try to resonate the loop. We're going to try to tune the loop. Why would anyone want to do something so silly? Now I need to have something out there I've got to tune. Well, let's see what the advantage is to having tuning right at the antenna.